So continuing the T-Reg thing, uh, we'll bring our final speaker up, uh, Carol Miao, who's going to talk about uh, the um, use of uh, regulatory T-cells uh, in inducing uh, tolerance, uh, I believe, to factor eight. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I think uh, both Roland and Drought have uh, give really a good introduction on how T-Rex cells are uh, very important in the induction of uh, fact A specific immune tolerance. So um, I will bring the talk back to uh, preclinical studies and talk a little bit more basic on uh, uh, how we modulated uh, uh, fact A immune responses in animal models. So regularly T cells uh, are an important T cell subpopulation uh, that maintain uh, immunological uh, hemostasis. And uh, um, the importance of uh, this population has been uh, studied uh, starting in 1970s that uh, this, the first subpopulation uh, is a CD4 positive, CD25 positive, FOXP3 positive uh, 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 T cell population. And mutations in the FOXP3 gene was identified in human IPEX patients. And the murine counterpart of the IPEX patients, uh, scurvy mice, um, lacks the uh, function of FOXP3 and shows similar phenotype in I IPEX patients. So this was studied by uh, Hans Ox group and uh, uh, other, other groups as well. So the role of T-Rex uh, in preventing autoimmunity and controlling immune responses is very well established. So in a simple sense, I'm just showing you this very uh, simple uh, diagram is that if uh, in an immune environment, if there is a, a higher or more significant T factor function compared to the T rat function, the immune responses issues. However, if there are more T racks or a higher T rat function uh, to the T factor cells, then uh, results leading to immune regulation, immune tolerance. Um, so recently, uh, there are clinical trials uh, manipulating T rat populations uh, to modulate. Uh, immune responses in autoimmunity and transplantation patients. Um, so there are three, uh, sub, uh, several uh, subtypes not being discovered in, uh, in T-Rex. Uh, the most significant one is the CD4 positive C25 and FOXP3 positive T-Rex, and that's the one that I will be emphasized uh, in uh, discussing today. And uh, these T-Rex can be derived from thymus as natural T-Rex, but they can also be induced peripherally uh, by antigens in counter. Um, and then uh, there's also ex vivo induced T-Rex, and these T-Rex usually, uh, their phenotype are sometimes uh, unstable when they are introduced in vivo. And more recently, there are also TR1 cells, uh, IL-10 positive FOXP3, uh, T-Rex cell type and other T-Rex cell types. So what does that have anything to do with immune tolerance to factor eight? So um, as Drought already uh, elu uh, eluded earlier, that 30% of the hemophilia A patients uh, develop inhibitory antibodies to factor eight following a protein replacement therapy. So if visibility of a successful gene therapy really depends on whether immune tolerance to factor A uh, can, be develop, uh, can be induced. So this is uh, just to show the model that we used in the hemophilia A mouse is that when you uh, hydrodynamically inject a factor A plasmid into a hemophilia A mice, you can obtain a very high level of factor A expression initially, however, the level drops pretty quickly, and that correlates really well with the antibody formation. So this is a, a pretty good model 
to study how we can modulate immune responses to FACT8. So initially, um, we uh, tried to use um, uh, immune uh, modulation strategies to uh, modulate these uh, anti-factor immune responses, these including disrupting of T and B cell interactions or using a T cell depleting agent such as anti-CD3. So when we administrate these drugs, we can show that with transient immunomodulation together with gene therapy of uh, uh, FACT8 plasma transfer, we can achieve uh, pretty long-term tolerance to factor A without any antibody formation, and the level uh, maintains pretty high levels. And this is actually associated with a depletion uh, or de decrease of the CD4 effector T cells, and as well as the increase of CD4 uh, FOXP3 positive T cells. And there is uh, apparently a shift from the uh, 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 to a regulatory uh, environment. So this can be seen also in the uh, very clearly shown in the anti-CD3 treatment that the CD4, uh, the CD4 effector T, so the anti-CD3 has a function that uh, it depletes more, uh, more uh, potently the, um, uh, the, the uh, effector T cells and not so much the regulatory T cells. So you can see that the um, the, the, the effector T cells gets depleted uh, uh, coming back slowly, but uh, the, uh, however, the uh, regulatory T cells increase significantly. And we later on actually uh, uh, obtained a uh, FOXP3 transgenic mice and isolated the uh, CD, CD4 FOX, FOXP3 T cells, uh, FOXP3 positive T cells from the transgenic mice and injected into the humane mice. And uh, these uh, transgenic uh, FOXP3 positive T cells uh, showed quite uh, potent protective uh, effect against anti factor immune responses. And most significantly, after second challenge, uh, we showed that uh, in the uh, control mice, there's a, a very high potent immune response compared to the FOXP3 T cell recipient mice that are very much protected after the second challenge. So this is probably caused by infectious tolerance mechanism. So this is a very important uh, concept in the TREC uh, where you uh, ma manipulate TREC cells because whatever you do with the TREC cells, it apparently uh, affects the naive endogenous T-Rex and uh, produce a, uh, uh, some antigen-specific T-Rex that can um, exert very long-term effect. So with this in mind, uh, we thought uh, we pretty much uh, show that the T-Rex cells uh, play a very important role in modulating anti-factor immune responses so the next question is that how can we use this concept to um, help the patients to evade the uh, anti-factor immune responses or induce tolerance? So this work, oh, actually um, this work was by Roland Herzog and uh, he also at the time show that rapamycin, I think he already mentioned that the rapamycin has also a very similar effect that can induce the um, increase of uh, T-Rex cells population. So at the time, uh, we found that this IL-2 and IL-2 monoclonal antibody can complex can specifically uh, induce T-Rex expansion so when the, uh, with a prior injection of this complex, uh, you act we actually can induce quite long-term tolerance uh, in contrast to the, the mouse that would develop uh, high titer inhibitors after uh, factor A plasmid transfer. So this is due to the uh, very robust expansion uh, of T-Rex cells uh, after the IL-2, IL-2 monoclonal antibody complex. Uh, injection. And another important aspect is that 
these expanded T-Rex are uh, quite activated initially uh, with very high um, CTLA-4 expression and C25 expression. Another interesting aspect of this is that we also tested the, um, the carnitine levels. Um, these mice, when the T-Rex was expanded, the carnitine levels, uh, which is a, a tryptophan uh, metabolized, is elevated together with the elevation of TGF-beta uh, uh, levels. So the simple mechanism, I think you can see this as a T-Rex feedback loop. It's more like if you have more T-Rex uh, produced, then you have more uh, carnitine and TGF-beta, which suppress the uh, proliferation of the activated T cells uh, and then apopt uh, induce apoptosis of activated T cells. Um, it also suppress the activated T cell function and also promote the, the, the more proliferation of the T-Rex cells. So in this kind of environment, uh, produce a, a, a strong feedback mechanism to favor a regulatory uh, environment is, uh, to induce antigen-specific tolerance. So in order to bring to the clinic, actually my lab uh, recently uh, used a low-dose IL-2 strategy because that is because the low-dose IL-2 has um, um, uh, IL-2 has high, uh, T-Rex cells ha has high affinity to, a uh, high affinity as receptor to the IL-2. And um, so with low dose, it actually increased the T-Rex uh, proliferation much more uh, potently than the effector T cells. So uh, as you can see that with, so what strategy we use is a combination of transfer of factor A plasmid and IL-2 plasmid together and uh, you can see that with um, two microgram of these uh, plasmid transfers, the t rat to T uh, effector ratio uh, was significantly increased. And we can uh, achieve therapeutic level uh, for factor expression for a very long time. Okay, so, so this is another method, I think, that is also uh, very useful to induce factor specific tolerance. Uh, recently, um, uh, this is in courtesy of David Scott, and by using a nanoparticle strategy uh, that you can uh, include uh, different uh, uh, proteins or antigen peptides, and together you can include tolerogenic agents or um, uh, some other uh, potential uh, reagent to induce tolerance. So this is a recent paper that um, uh, people, so they use the uh, nanoparticles that encapsulate a uh, rapamycin uh, together with the uh, factor eight peptide that induced tolerance uh, in the hemophilia in mice. So, um, so this is just the results to show that it has a very strong uh, modulatory effect by using nanoparticle strategies. And I also want to bring this new, um, new way of trying to induce tolerance to factor VIII um, in this talk is by delivery of the mRNA and lipid nanoparticles uh, encapsulated um, in the uh, uh, limp lipid nanoparticles to induce tolerance to factor VIII. So um, we actually show that by using a, um, uh, this, is, this uh, is in collaboration with the Moderna Therapeutics. Um, the, um, the lipid nanoparticle can actually deliver a full length factor VIII into the, um, pretty efficiently into the liver, and uh, we can achieve low levels of factor expression. However, by encapsulating a really, uh, uh, a B domain deleted factor VIII, a very high level of factor VIII can be achieved. So the strategy is that if we deliver this uh, MRA of factor VIII 
together with a, uh, a immunomodulator molecule, MRA, we may uh, be able to replace the immune, to uh, immune tolerance induction protocol and be more effective to treat, um, to establish the tolerance state for the hemophilia patient. So then I'm, I like to uh, switch my gear to T-Rex cell therapy. So why T-Rex cell therapy? So of course we know T-Rex has very strong suppressive function to control the immune tolerance, uh, control immune response. And there's previous work uh, with in vivo um, T-Rex expansion demonstrated the potential to modulate uh, inhibitory response. And there has been established ex vivo method for expanding the cell population. And T-Rex cell therapy is now uh, in clinical trials uh, in several disease models. So the approach is potentially we can use, we can isolate, enrich, and expand T-Rex with uh, antigen uh, uh, stimulation or secondly, we can engineer a specificity in polyclonal T-Rex uh, using transduction of specific uh, T-cell receptors or use a CAR strategy. So this is actually uh, from Roland's lab that um, it showed that uh, by using a polyclonal uh, T-Rex, uh, they were able to show that it can uh, modulate the inhibitory response uh, in, uh, in uh, hemophilia A mice. So in his lab, I think it's also very clearly these ex, ex vivo expanded transplanted T-Rex can modulate the, um, modify the, um, the antigen presenting cells to promote um, the induction of the uh, endogenous uh, antigen specific T-Rex. So it's kind of a similar uh, idea of infectious tolerance. And I think he recently also used the polyclonal T-Rex to uh, in the uh, AAB gene transfer uh, for uh, in hemophilia B mice. And it, can sh it shows that it can suppress the uh, uh, anti-vector 9 uh, inhibitory response as well. So uh, there's some advantage of using polyclonal non-specific T-Rex because you don't have to manipulate these T-Rex. However, um, and then um, in clinical studies, it's also, they're also in the way. However, there are some caveats to it because the number of cells required for polyclonal T-Rex may be uh, 10 to 100 fold higher than antigen specific T-Rex that is uh, being estimated from some of the um, other studies uh, in autoimmune diseases. And the frequency of these relevant regular T cells uh, may be quite low. And expanded polyclonal T-Rex, um, maybe uh, some of them could be non-specifically immunosuppressive, so uh, there could be some safety concerns. So, so we have used a uh, effective specific uh, strategy to expand antigen specific T-Rex. And we can show that the, the more, the fact that antigen specific T-Rex actually has a much higher suppressive activity than the non-specific T-Rex. And by adopting transfer of these antigen specifically expanded T-Rex, um, we can show that these T-Rex are uh, and then uh, transfer them into the um, recipient heme mice, and these T-Rex uh, uh, can, uh, can sustain being activated. However, the level um, drops pretty quickly, and, um, and they, they actually kept in the activated state uh, quite a long time. And this is showing that the endogenous T-Rex are actually also activated. And uh, we can show that in the uh, recipient mice, um, the, 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 the mice that receive these antigen-specific T-Rex can be, uh, uh, can suppress the immune response more, 
uh, more potently than the uh, naive uh, mice. So, so that's one way of manipulating the T-Rex. So another way is to um, uh, learn from the cancer therapy as to how we can actually uh, modify the chimeric using either TCR or chimeric antigen receptor to um, modify a regulatory T cell uh, to make them into antigen-specific uh, T-Rex cells. So uh, this is uh, David Scott's uh, work that uh, they isolate the human T-Rex cells uh, from uh, using the C25 and CD127 markers and um, isolate these cells and uh, transduce them with uh, lentiviruses. And as you can see that uh, both the uh, TCR uh, modified T-Rex and also the CAR T-Rex uh, can suppress the anti-factor A immune responses quite specifically. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so this one is actually from the TCR modified T-Rex and these are from the, the CAR uh, T-Rex. So uh, we have also uh, uh, try to uh, modify the the uh, the T-Rex cells using a uh, uh, CAR uh, strategy. So in, uh, in the in a mouse model, so these are uh, the mouse uh, signaling uh, molecules uh, uh, conjugated with uh, linked with the uh, 2A peptide with the murine FOXP3 transgene. So um, in this way, uh, we felt like um, we may overcome the problem of the instability of the T-Rex phenotype after in vivo transfer. And we can show that we were able to achieve uh, good transduction uh, using a cocoa envelope uh, pseudotyped uh, lentivirus uh, in, um, uh, in the uh, T-cells. Actually, this work has um, taken quite a bit of work because, uh, quite difficult, because mouse T cells apparently is not as permissive as the human T cells, and uh, it was difficult to um, uh, transduce these mouse T cells. Uh, so we obtained this specifically a uh, cocoa uh, pseudotype lentivirus from uh, Hans Peter's lab at Fred Hutch, and then we were able to achieve a quite significant transduction. And it apparently uh, has a very good uh, suppressive activity against uh, T effector cells, antigen specifically. And uh, we can show that after adoptive transfer, uh, we can get um, uh, modulate the, the T cell response um, uh, in the uh, uh, mice receive, uh, receive, receiving the uh, uh, CAR FOXP3 and uh, Fox, uh, sorry, the CAR modified um, FOXP3 positive uh, T cells. Okay, so um, so this is kind of a summary of how we utilizing the regular T cells to overcome anti-effective immune responses. So, um, so, so there are uh, different ways, like um, uh, Roland Dodd has talked about just using AAV vector, uh, but here we also talk about uh, some ways is to, we can use uh, some immunomodulation uh, strategies, uh, including uh, different immunomodulation agents, or uh, even use nanoparticles uh, to encapsulate some tolerogenic agents. And we can uh, use induce in vivo expansion of T-Rex, and uh, we can also uh, use T-Rex cell therapy. This including you, uh, starting with thymus uh, derived T-Rex that we can um, uh, use polyclonal non-specific T-Rex antigen specifically expanded T-Rex, 
TCR modified um, antigen specific T Rex or CAR modified T Rex, or I think, um, oh, and the, this last one, I think David Rollins and Andy Schoenberg's lab has recently been very successful in gene editing uh, some of the antigen specific T Rex, and these are very potent uh, T Rex. Um, and then there's um, CD4 T, so if you start with CD4 T cells, you can also modify them with chimeric antigen plus a FOXP3 uh, transgene to um, achieve uh, the production of antigen specific T Rex. And uh, it will be interesting to see uh, some of these uh, that can be brought into clinical, uh, clinical trials. And uh, of course, there are. Uh, questions and challenges uh, involved in in some of these, uh, specifically in the in the Treg therapy, um, the the elimination, the reduction re reduction of the um, uh, non-specific um, uh, suppressive effect would be a a, a good problem that um, to avoid. Okay, so it's just to show us some of the work were done by my lab, so I'm just showing the <clears throat> acknowledgement here. Thanks. Thanks, Kyok. Uh, we have time for just uh, probably one quick question from the audience. Um, I will, um, actually, maybe I, I may let Dwight take that if that's his plan. <clears throat> okay. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, Carol, I was just, what do you think of the difference in immune response between the AV vector expressing factor eight, specifically liver, and your plasmid vector that contains a liver specific promoter but still provokes antibodies? Is it just a matter of packaging as AAV and the tropism of AAV to hepatocytes? Or what, were you surprised at all to see antibodies in response to your plasmid vector? I think I'm not surprised to see, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm not surprised to see the antibody because factor eight is quite immunogenic. So I think AAV, you know, depending on the dose, I think you use, and uh, um, so <laughs> I think AAV. Maybe Roland can can allude to this, but AAV maybe have a specific mechanism that uh, can um, specifically help inducing tolerance. Okay, thank you. Or any other questions? All right, thank you. That's the end of the session. <laughs>